पायल Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in the 25th lecture of the Ann Biology webinar series. I am Shinjini, and I am your moderator for today's session. Organized by the Translational Outcomes Research Group of the Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta, uh, the Ann Biology webinar series aims to showcase the latest advances in the field of biology, as well as the interconnectedness of biology with other disciplines. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that you can post your questions in the YouTube chat box and we shall moderate them at the end of the lecture. And a feedback link will be provided in the chat box near the end of the session. And so without further delay, I would like to invite our guest, Professor Rajagopal Dhar Chakraborty, the head of the department, Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, University of Calcutta. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you, sir. I, our mentor and convener, Professor Anare Banerjee, unfortunately couldn't join us today, but she sends us uh, sends her best wishes for today's session. So, uh, before handing over to Sir, I would like to give a short introduction. So, Professor Rajagopal Dhar Chakraborty is currently the head of the department, Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, University of Calcutta. Till recently, he was the director of the Indian School, uh, Indian Institute of Social Welfare and Business Management, the first B school set up in India. He was the registrar of the University of Calcutta for a year from April 2017 and was also the university's deputy registrar in 1989 to 1990. He has been a professor of economics and demography in the same university since August 2002. He is also an international faculty with the United Nations International Institute on Aging at Malta. He held the post of full-time head of the department for several terms and was the main coordinator for India-China Knowledge, Initiative and Capacity Building, a tripartite project involving Calcutta University, Yunnan University in China and the New School, New York. Professor Chakraborty was in the court of Manipur University as a nominee of the President of India and also a nominee of the President of India in the selection of faculty members of the Sikkim National University. Having studied at Calcutta University, the London School of Economics and the East-West Centre in Hawaii, Professor Chakraborty has taught at the Centre for Developmental, uh, Development Studies, Trivandrum, St. Xavier's College, Calcutta and various other institutions in India and abroad. He was a visiting professor at the Department of Gerontology, St. Thomas University, Canada, Department of Management in uh, Tianjin University, China, the University of Population and Development, Nankai University, China and the Population Research Centre, Renmin University, China. Professor Chakraborty has also given invited lectures in institutes and UN bodies in several countries. A former visiting fellow of the London School of Economics and Political Science, Professor Chakraborty is a recipient of the Ford Foundation sponsored Asia Fellowship and research extensively on aging patterns in China. He is a recipient of the Wellcome Trust Postdoctoral Fellowship. Widely traveled, Professor Chakraborty has several publications on the subject of aging, demography and political economy. His The Greying of India, published by Sage Publications, uh, Thousand Oaks, and Quantitative Methods, published by McGraw-Hill, was well received by the media and market. He appears regularly on page edit, TV, and social media talk shows on international relations, domestic, political, and economic issues to communicate to people on matters of their in importance. So, sir, I hand over to you now. Uh, so, you can start your lecture. Uh, thank you, Singh Jini. Uh, uh, it was a, a very warm welcome. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, my good friend at Calcutta University, Dr. Uh, Enaroy Banerjee, Professor Dr. Enaroy Banerjee, you know, he told me he told me about this program a long time back, and I committed some time uh, early this year, but you know that because of some uh, uh, preoccupation somewhere, I could not join. But I'm very happy that I could finally join. Uh, yes, uh, I am not a uh, biologist uh, and a uh, uh, scientist in the strict sense of the term, uh, but I must say that uh, uh, I am a 
keen observer of uh, things happening around uh, in the field of biological development, particularly in the field of, the field of agriculture. And today I would like to talk about uh, uh, biotechnology and uh, biotechnology development that have, uh, that have the potentials but could not be fully utilized. And just go straight to the straight to the uh, my slides. Right? Okay. Can you see? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. yes. You can see that uh, biotechnology and uh, a revolution, uh, I know that I put it in the single inverted comma in the sense that uh, 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 revolution, you know, that it has its um, dreams and fulfillment. Uh, but uh, biotechnology revolution, it has only the dreams and uh, fulfillment has not uh, been realized again. Again, I'll come back to that. I mean, that why it was a, uh, I know that I don't st strictly call it a revolution which is fulfilled. But I don't say it's a revolution which is about it, but uh, it's a revolution in definitely the way it has progressed, the dream it has sown, it, is a, it has the potential of a, of a revolution. Um, ladies and gentlemen who are listening uh, to this show, and uh, you all know that uh, we had uh, long uh, uh, innings. Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir, but uh, can you put it in the slideshow mode one? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, can you see it in a slice? So yes, much? sir. And uh, so, okay. can you hide that bar at the bottom of your uh, screen? Okay, hide. okay, okay. I'll, I'll do the hiding. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. thank you, okay. sir. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, keep me advising uh, in case I falter. Yes. Uh, you know, the technology is, you know, that I, I am a senior person in the sense that I've already grown aged. And technology, you know, that I have not been able to master in the way you people have mastered. Anyway, so um, ladies and gentlemen who, uh, who are part of the show, you all know that uh, poverty and famines, uh, they dominated uh, the human history, particularly in the developing countries, Asian countries, right? Uh, we have a very high population and we have low food production. And some of you are familiar with uh, Malthus name of Malthus, Thomas Robert Malthus, and he had a theory, he says that uh, population, you know, it starts growing when food production becomes higher than population. And I know that and when we have a higher food production, people think in terms of multiplying and that results in a higher food demand and food supply do not match. And then there is a, uh, you know, that, uh, natural calamities, a lot of people die because of food shortage, and there is a balance. You know, I'm not getting into the Malthusian theory, but uh, fact is that poverty and famines dominated uh, human history, uh, particularly in Asia. I'll show you some of the uh, famines, uh, famines where, you know, that uh, from 40s to 70s, we had famines, enormous amount of famines uh, uh, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. I don't like to get into the history part of it, you know, that from you know, I just, and I, I just wanted to include only 50s, but uh, since you organized this show from Bengal, you all know that Bengal famine of 1943, right, which killed uh, uh, several million people. We have a, uh, we have in Java, you know, that uh, in Indonesia, Java, we had, a, we had a crisis in 44, 45, we have a Vietnamese famine in 45, and you can know that this country, you know, that uh, China. China had a great famine in 5961. Several million people died, and uh, Chinese, you know, they're, they're crazy about sharing data, and you know, and it could be anything from uh, 15 million to uh, 55 million. It's a large number of people. We have in 66, 67 Indonesian uh, famines. We have in 74 Bangladesh famines. A lot of people, you know, that died, and. You see that uh, we do not hear much of famines today. You know, people say that uh, some of the famines were were created uh, because of human greed and all that. They created artificial shortage. Uh, I'm not getting into that debate, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, then my primary purpose is to say that uh, we had food food scarcity. We had food scarcity, and it continued for several years. And we have a technological change. You see that uh, technology. You know, the technology has been evolved and new technology comes in whenever there is a, there is a crisis. 
you know, that uh, we had, if, if you see, in, in agriculture, we have a nomadic kind of cultivation, slash bird cultivation. From that cultivation, we uh, came into plow cultivation. Cultivation, then, uh, you know, the whatever food we could produce, then plow cultivation, you know, we are able to produce uh, some more food. And that was not enough. Then, you know, that in, this, in the 60s, in the particularly 70s onwards, uh, we had a revolution called Green Revolution. We have the Green Revolution technology. And that changed the whole scenario. Green Revolution technology. We have, uh, you know, they'll come back to that technology. And and then, you know, that finally we have uh, evolved a biotechnology. Uh, it's a, another, 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 you know, that we have realized that Green Revolution cannot tackle. So the biotechnology has already come into the picture. Right. Okay. Now, Green Revolution technology came in 70s and you know, all that. Uh, we have high yielding varieties um, of seeds, particularly cereals. I uh, you know that cereals were, were the staple in, uh, in many countries, particularly in Asia. Uh, high yielding varieties. We have for rice, International Rice Institute in Manila. They developed uh, uh, high yielding variety seed for, uh, seed for rice. And you know that uh, because of the Green Revolution, you know that was implemented uh, almost uh, all the countries in Asia. We had improvements in food security, and poverty got reduced. And cereal production, you know, it's jumped. You know that it's not a it's not a, it's not a simple increase. It's, it's jumped. I'll show you some of the figures. And in 1975. You know that we had every two when the second Asian was a, one uh, was living in under poverty. And almost that means fifty percent was under poverty line. But ninety five in nineteen ninety five, uh, this uh, became only one in four, which means twenty five percent was a uh, was a uh, was a poverty line. Uh, and you see that uh, people below the poverty line. I mean, uh, and since then, you know that that is uh, that we have not been able to reduce poverty further. Uh, which shows that green evolution has its own limitations. Uh, but you know that before you come to the limitations, what do you see the cereal products? I say it's young, you know that. Uh, this I uh, uh, produce you from the World Bank. Uh, you know, I have you know that, uh, put together World Bank uh, data, World, World Development Indicator. Some of your families, they, they, they publish the World Development Report every year. and. Uh, so we have uh, for several years, from 1961 to uh, 2018, I have given you the data. Just see, you know, that India, 87.4 million metric of the sick, you know, that, you know, that four times jump. Uh, in China, almost six times jump. In Bangladesh, even, you know, that Bangladesh, you know, that when Bangladesh was created, you know, there's so much of food shortage. I have told you 1974 that many experts thought that Bangladesh cannot be set. You know, they have been, they were able to you know the more than uh, four, uh, four times their cereal productions. Indonesia were a couple of times, almost seven percent, seven times. Philippines, five point two million metric ton to twenty six. Vietnam also, you see the significant jump. Uh, right, almost all the Asian. I know that I mean, some of the, the countries I have put it here, uh, they had a significant jump in cereal production. But the result is that uh, people are eating well. People uh, are. Not living uh, under poverty, I mean, uh, poverty line, not number of people living below poverty line has uh, gone down significantly. And you know that uh, this is simply a, a table which I uh, reproduced from uh, our world in data. Now, uh, you see that uh, from 1820, they have produced this, this wonderful, wonderful table uh, from uh, in the World Bank data as well as a very famous economist called Revelion. Uh, French economist uh, here studied extensively on poverty. Uh, you know that this table, this uh, this graph tells that you know that we had poverty, uh, extreme poverty. This red line area is extreme poverty from 1820. You know that you know, and post you know the Second World War onwards, it increased, and uh, this is the period when uh, green revolution started, and we had some decline. Okay, okay, and people. Uh, Away from poverty, their numbers are rising. Their numbers are rising. Many know that we expected all the people to be away from poverty line, but that did not happen yet. And uh, so, what are the challenges? You see that uh, the main challenges are that uh, of the green revolution technology is that uh, government uh, investment has uh, declined. 
and you must uh, remember that public sector investment are the uh, largest component of uh, investment in agricultural research and development. And Asia's Asian countries, you know, they are spending on uh, agricultural research, you know, that's, that's gone down. Uh, it was an 87.5 and down to 4.4 percent in the 1990s. And developmental agency, I mentioned to you about International Rights Research Institute, and it is uh, one of the, you know, the, one of the project of consultative group on international research, uh, CGIAR. I uh, you know that you probably have, uh, it's, a, it's a large international body, and uh, they created IRRI in ED, uh, as it is called in Philippines, Manila. And, you know, the investment, they also reduced, and because priorities have changes from agricultural research to other priorities, you know, that, and Many things happened, and uh, I just give you some uh, rough idea about that. You know, in the 50s, share of agriculture in total investment was almost 18 percent, and you know that uh, this agricultural investment declining, declining, and uh, public investment. If you see there, you know, the situation here also is declining, and agriculture, which was you know that almost 56 percent uh, share of agriculture in total GDP. Have gone gone down to 19 percent so so if you understand agricultural scenario has changed enormously agriculture you know, you know that uh, you know, I know that after, after green revolution people thought we have been able to tackle food problem and it's a relaxed mood people are withdrawing money from agricultural research agricultural investment and yes this figure tells you that public uh, you know that uh, public dominates uh, by in, uh, agricultural researches 93 percent in developing countries but only developed countries you know that more in private you all know that multinational giants and the biotechnology in the developed countries uh, among Sanato and others uh, they they have the capacity to buy you know that they have the you know yearly selling uh, you know that uh, turnover is much more than many developing countries uh, national income anyway that's not the issue so you understand that uh, in developing countries, public investment is dominant, and once you know that the government, uh, you know, then that takes a like a approach towards agricultural investment, you know, that then we have that we have the crisis both in India and China. I come to China like my second home, and I have seen that agriculture was neglected because government thought that you know that people are eating well, but what is happening? You know, people are. Mm -hmm, uh, unable to understand that population is growing, right? In the next 20 to 20 to 20, you know, the fact that population is stabilized to a great extent. I'll show you some of the some data that will show that population uh, has grow, grown but stabilized to a certain extent, and uh, but population will still rise in the next 20 to 25 years uh, by another 3 billion. Just to see the population. You can see India's population 450 million. I you know that in 2000 is is a 20 it is 1380. You know that, and China. I you know that we are very close to China right now, and you know that is not stabilized in many countries. In if you see Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, uh, it all got stabilized. Uh, in even, even Bangladesh, you know that you know, uh, getting stabilized, but you know that uh, we have not been able to. Uh, stabilized population much, and uh, we have a we'll have three billion extra, three to four billion extra people in the next 20, 25 um, uh, years. And you see, if you see the projection, these projections, uh, the world as a whole, you know, that this is the normal trend. Uh, if there is a no checks uh, in population control, uh, this is the normal trend, and there are several, you no, know, that um, as, uh, uh, assumptions on which this projection model is based. And uh, we have, you know, that uh, uh, this is the most um, uh, bold assumption, uh, which, say, which will say, we say the population will decline. But otherwise, up to 2100, uh, you know, the population is, is rising. This is a situation in Asia. Asia's population, you can see the very similar trend. And also, we have India's situations, uh, right, in future. You know, it's not that... Uh, <laughs> Many of them, I know that at some sense we will have a population population, but these are, I do not know, these are all very, very uh, strong assumptions about the future mortality and fertility pattern, and uh, whether that will occur, we have no knowledge. Uh, I know that, so you see that we have a population growing and green revolution not able to tackle the problem. Uh, we have, uh, you know, that green revolution in, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, population food supply uh, or food supply demand mismatch, 
uh, green revolutionary problem of you know that uh, uh, they are they, they favored irrigated environment but in in most of the counties in small older holders so it's marginal lands and land is rent fed uh, cultivation is done under rent fed situations and green revolution also created uh, many problems of salinity pesticide misuse degradation and so many such such things and as you know that uh, if you see that uh, food supply and supply uh, food demand and supply is match and you know that uh, we know not only have a population rise but we have a diet shifting this is very important because of urbanization people you know that uh, moving away from diet based on uh, root crops uh, right cassava yam sweet potato and also sorghum millets and maize you know that they are now more into rice and wheat and because they have much less time to prepare and also you know that they are buying more meat more milk for fruits vegetables and processed fruit right so you know that uh, all these require that we have need to have more agricultural productions right and cereal demands is uh, will rise by 40% uh, from the present level of 650 million uh, tons uh, through the through Asian countries and okay, we need much more productions what happens you know that we have less water available now because you know the underground water uh, you know that uh, almost evaporated because of overuse and so we have to produce with uh, less land less water and uh, in some cases less labor too so green revolution technology probably cannot cannot uh, match the requirement of today and tomorrow right so again you know that um, Uh, we have to take uh, use of science and technology and science and technology they are the foundation of uh, agricultural productivity uh, right we we know that we had plow cultivation is the first scientific discovery uh, the green revolution then uh, finally we are having this uh, biotechnology and uh, oh, so as we see that uh, we have to take the help of science and technology again or rather science and technology has come forward uh, to take the challenge of uh, of a rising uh, population and changing dietary habits a more requirement of cereals more requirement of meat and animals you know the meat uh, you know the animals it to be provided with uh, uh, with, with with food right corn soybean you know that right they need to be provided with uh, the good food so right so we require more production in agriculture and you know that the equation from your uh, uh, food grain is it is shifting simply in our uh, diet from vegetarian food to uh, animal protein and uh, you know that is uh, it's not a simple uh, linear no that is much sometimes it's, uh, it's much more we you know that we spend more on, we have to provide our animals um, much more grains uh, than the amount of amount of uh, uh, meat equivalent we get right uh, for example the cow has to be given 25 kg of cereals or 25 kg of grains uh, to get 1 kg of meat anyway so it, what i want to say is that we require more more grains more uh, food crops for both for animals and as well as for man right and Uh, there is a uh, there is a family, very famous uh, personality called Cohen. I know that he says uh, that uh, uh, we require biotechnology for sustainable productivity creations, and we have the GM crops, and it is uh, produced by transfer of genes uh, between organisms for specific traits using laboratory techniques. in you know, a plants we produce out of these um, technologies called uh, gmo or genetically modified uh, organisms or genetically engineered or transgenic plants i mean that uh, gm crops uh, i will talk mainly about gm crops uh, at, uh, in this presentation and uh, you know that we we from these uh, shortages we need it you know then biotechnology has offered us many alternatives and this genetically modified organisms gm crops uh, uh, is uh, is one agricultural scientists biotechnologists 
And uh, probably well, uh, you all familiar that the first uh, transgenic crop that was developed that once really uh, enormously successful was flavor 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 uh, tomato. Uh, that tomato was used in several Asian countries, and and you know that uh, after the successful flavor silver tomato, the GM crops not only in case of food but non-food particularly uh, in case of you know, cotton, uh, canola, canola is a food, yes, but cotton, mainly, mainly cotton, and, uh, you know, that it has been developed and commercialized uh, uh, throughout the world. And, uh, you know, that these GM crops uh, have the ability to tackle many things, you know, that crop is genetically modified to tackle insect resistance, disease resistance, herbicide tolerance, and it can also add uh, nutritional quality. And because of all these, you know, the favorable uh, uh, features uh, which GM crops have, this has led to large-scale cultivation of GM crops. Uh, Telugu, in 2019, uh, around 119 million hectares of bio crop were grown in 29 countries, 29 countries. And GM crops have been commercialized in the past 20 years. Uh, crops, you know, the tomato, corn, shabin, cotton, canola, rice. Canola is oil, probably. I don't know. No, we don't get canola oil uh, in this country, but if you go to the developed countries, uh, we have um, uh, uh, canola. Canola oil is a very, very popular and cheap oil, uh, right? Edible oil, I mean, that canola, uh, right, you know. And then rice, potato, squash, melon, papaya. Papaya, I know that in Southeast Asia, there is a collaboration. I'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know that uh, uh, this uh, development, uh, commercialization, first, you know that development in science and technology, then commercial applications, uh, successful commercial applications uh, have resulted in a significant, uh, you know, that. Uh, Food security issues, right? You all know that we have a climatic change, and uh, and uh, because of climate change, uh, in, in part of agriculture is under serious stress. And uh, biotechnology, many people say that uh, biotechnology is the answer, it can provide the answer in case of uh, uh, you know the damage uh, that is being uh, uh, apprehended for our farmers uh, because of climate change. And already you know there are many countries which used uh, GM crops. There is a double digit growth uh, in Vietnam, Philippines, you know, that in two Asian countries they have some significant growth. Also, Colombia, you know, uh, Colombia in, uh, in uh, is a Latin American countries uh, where we have uh, Catezina, that we had a Catezina, uh, you know, we have a protocol, Catezina protocol, how to use uh, biotechnology. Uh, okay. I'll come back to that okay now mm -hmm. so this is uh, this uh, pie chart tells you the um, products from 1996 to 2008 you know that almost total uh, total valuation comes to around us dollar 225 uh, 225 billion you can see that uh, major chunk is the uh, insect resistance ir cotton which is called bt cotton and uh, know that they, they have uh, a major part of the gym crops, then corn, uh, insect resistance corn is also very high. Uh, also, herbicide tolerance, HT sh shoya, uh, 28.5%. You know that you can see the uh, uh, major component of uh, various crops and countries. You can see over here, you know, that US, you know, that they have done a significant uh, uh, use of. GM crops almost 42 percent, uh, you know that from 1996 to 2018, you know, then in cumulative framework, uh, United States uh, they produce uh, almost almost 43 percent of total productions, and India, you know, the 10.8 percent. India is this part, you know, but Argentina, Brazil, uh, they are doing well, uh, right? And okay, China is 10.3 percent and. I'll come back to the issues here now. Okay. 
uh, GM crops uh, in India, I know that uh, several crops are being produced, you know, that, but not, not produced, you know, that they are mm -hmm. uh, an application stage, you know, there is a rigorous, uh, rigorous um, process of uh, relating to uh, GM crops, uh, uh, its, uh, its development, uh, its, its, its promotion, and uh, commercialization, you know, that it has to be a Passed through several uh, field trials, and uh, agencies have to be, you know, they're satisfied that it does not create much of damage to the uh, our uh, environmental uh, ecosystem. Okay, right, and uh, uh, we can see that several varieties, several applications are still pending. You know that cotton has a several applications, cotton. And you know, these are several traits, you know, that insect resistance cotton, herbicide tolerant, virus resistance, and uh, water and nitrogen efficiency. You know, that it can provide several, you know, that uh, several varieties of uh, cotton seeds are being produced, uh, which can tackle uh, many uh, uh, problems uh, in, the, uh, in the production of these. Uh, we have brinjal, you know, that probably uh, you are familiar with the controversies. I'll come back to the controversies. Here, <coughs> I'm very pleased that uh, for rice, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we are not only insect resistance and herbicide tolerance, we have nutritional supplement, nutrition supplement, nutrition supplement. Uh, you know, the Botany, the department of Botany department, Calcutta University, they have uh, provided an application. Uh, we are very happy for Chikpi in the Jorat University, Assam Agriculture University, they have applied. But most of the applications are in. You see, the public have given you know public ventures are much less. Uh, most of the ventures are in the private sector and multinational giants like uh, Monsanto. Uh, right, they are they are they do dominate. Okay, mm -hmm. and and some of the environmental uh, you know that um, uh, benefits uh, which GM crops provide. Uh, you do less uh, tilling of the land. And because of tilling of the land, uh, topsoils are lost, erosion, etc. Uh, so, and pest resistance GM crops like uh, BT cotton, corn, eggplant, uh, fewer application of pesticides. So, pesticides, you do not have to apply much of pesticides. Uh, and as we have done in earlier situation, uh, if you use pest resistant, herbicide tolerant, you know, they do not have to use uh, herbicides. And uh, hand weeding uh, is reduced. Agriculture, you know that uh, because of uh, uh, less use of these uh, herbicide, pastes, and fertilizers, you know that uh, uh, people predict that we will have a uh, less uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And I can give you one estimate which says that chemical pesticide use has been reduced. Uh, in where it has this GM crop has been introduced by 37 percent, crop yields uh, increased by 22 percent, farmers' profit increased by 68 percent, and CO2 emission you know that uh, reduced by 27 billion kg, which is equivalent to 12 million cars of the road. So, you know, that many advantages we have, and uh, GMO, uh, GMO crops, you know, then are. Coming up in public sectors uh, uh, for you know the, for nutritional content, viability of you know that uh, uh, staple food crops you know that in cassava pulses in India we have you know that we are thinking in terms of you know, the public sector they have uh, they are providing GM crops with nutritional benefits you know that also in mustard you know that in our country there are. Uh, you know, GM crops with mustards, with a lot of uh, new traits, and many other countries. But uh, in rice, in case Indonesia, Indonesia is rice economy. You know, you know that they have they are trying to develop many varieties of rice which are, which are capable of tackling uh, tackling many various issues relating to productions. Uh, you know, we have a banana, uh, various types of. Uh, uh, viruses, the crop bananas, and you know that uh, biotechnology, you know, that have taken enough care. And these are the crops grown by small farmers, small farmers. 
So they are going to benefit, you know, that if there is a uh, successful implementation, uh, we have developed uh, uh, research is complete. We can see, yes, we need further researches in case of difficult, in case of problems. Well, you know, the early stage of research is complete on very, most of the areas. And safety, you know, that for safety of GM goods, we have, as I mentioned to you, Cartagena protocol. Cartagena, I told you, is in, is in the city in Colombia, in Latin America. You know, this was the UN protocol. I mean, what need to be done to provide safety to bio uh, GM crafts, right? You know, this even it was in 2003 that they organized this. Um, they organized this. So, Cartagena uh, protocols, uh, right? And uh, that it is ratified by 173. It's a protocol signed by several countries. And they have to ratify in their own country, which means that they have to have their own laws, regulations, right? In 173 countries, they say that they have ratified these Katazina protocols and Katazina protocol uh, ratified by China. And the ratified, they have the seed law, People's Republic of China. It tells rigorously about the breeding, experimentation, registration, uh, promotion of GM plant, right? And agriculture GMOs are regulated by uh, uh, regulations on the administration of safety and agricultural uh, GGMOs. We have the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. We, they call, we call it MARA. is the agency which is responsible for uh, GMO. We know that supervision administration in our country. You know that we have modified, we have ratified Katazina protocol. Uh, we have the Ministry of Environment uh, responsible for these. And they have also, act, uh, they, have, we, they, they use the Environmental Protection Act of 1986 uh, for for GM crops control, right? And ministry has an agency called GEAC, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee, which uh, you know responsible for approval of uh, GM crops in the country. And government is thinking in terms of a, a regulatory board, new regulatory board for called BRAI, uh, Biotechnology Regulatory Authority, for a, when a single window clearance. Okay. There was a bill, but you know that by in the in the parliament, but it was not finally uh, finally enacted because of pressure of farmers, uh, right? I know that we have we have the government of India. The current government uh, is very much in favor of biotechnology, and they they think that uh, there is a need for a biotech kishan. Uh, in two thousand seven, they already started this and biotech kishan. You know that uh, so that so that the farmers uh, have the uprooted knowledge through an. Um, through an introduction, through, a, through a, in a, a networking with uh, with the scientists, right? They have developed a, uh, the scheme, uh, biotech issue. Government uh, has provided, you know, they provided a, 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 a huge amount of uh, uh, fund and resource logistic facilities. So that in almost in every environmental climatic region, uh, we have we have. Uh, uh, Farmers having this uh, access to the modern technology, right? Uh, we have, you know, the genetically engineered cotton in India, you know, the GM cotton. Uh, and so, no, that this um, Monsanto, this very famous uh, multinational, and you know, that they have uh, collaboration with Maharashtra Seed Company, Mahiko. And this is the only, only GM crop which is commercially allowed in the country, right? And uh, I give you some of the figures. Uh, BT cotton in India. Uh, okay, uh, you can see that BT cotton production area. You know that uh, it, it was uh, total area was in 2002 86 lakh hectare, of which only 0.29 was uh, devoted to BT cotton. Uh, BT cotton is insect resistant cotton, and right from that onward, you can see that. In 2019-20, we had a 125 billion hectares, uh, 125 lakh hectares in uh, cotton production, of which 117 in BT cotton, which means that I uh, know that almost over 90 percent of our cotton cotton production is in under BT cotton. We have a significant jams in product, jam in jump in production. Also yield, you know that which was only 191. Uh, you know the yield has also gone up. You know then. We have a significant uh, chunk of BT cotton in China. Uh, you can see that China also implemented cotton. You know, almost uh, almost all the countries they have implemented commercially this uh, cotton. And ninety five percent of the total area is under GM GM cotton. And uh, they say that 
uh, average increase in profitability has gone up uh, by 366 uh, dollar per hectare he said right you can see that uh, yield has gone up eight percent to ten percent almost everywhere you know that china has successfully uh, used it in bt cotton you know that pakistan also used it you know that pakistan produces uh, great quality of cotton uh, right and 96 percent of cotton land in pakistan is under uh, this thing this you know, bt cotton so bt cotton enormously 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 uh, enormously used in the cotton producing areas right and uh, while talking about china you must say that you know that the current government uh, uh, Xi Jinping government, uh, which is in the, in the power today, right? Uh, they believe very strongly that uh, GMOs are to be promoted, right? But cautiously. And, and you see that in 2020, in the last year, parties uh, CPC, CPC, Chinese Communist Party, their uh, fifth plenary meeting, they say that uh, biological breeding is. Uh, is it's very important. If the China has to grow uh, technologically well, they have to have biological breeding. And you know that the parties, uh, you know, that in China, all decisions, uh, whether economic and political, are taken by Communist Party. And it's a biological breeding. Uh, breeding. They say that is uh, one of the uh, eight uh, uh, strategy to improve the country's economy. Right? Okay. And I talked to you about the papaya biotechnology that was uh, developed in Southeast Asia. You know that many countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, together, they have the papaya biotechnology network, right? And uh, you know that uh, you know, there is a research, you know, that uh, and, uh, and um, uh, whatever uh, uh, research output that is shared. And uh, in, in, now they're in a position to you know that to have a whole uh, Asian countries uh, having a uh, having a having a singular policy with regard to these uh, biotechnological you know, the papaya right uh, it is not yet commercially released yet yet but you know that they have been able to able to pinpoint uh, several viruses particularly ring spot virus and delayed ripening issues uh, they're tackling you know that and uh, soon you know that uh, whole of Southeast Asia so the Asian network, ASEA, and Asian, Asian, you know, that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a regional block of Southeast Asian countries. Yeah, they have, uh, you know, that they have chosen papaya. Uh, it's one of the one of the major fruit, and it has, uh, you know, that various nutritional uh, equivalents. So they are they are working seriously on papaya. And you see the Vietnam, you know, that they have given a very very high high care to um, biotechnology. Uh, they have the Institute of Biotechnology Hanoi. Uh, you know that they, they are uh, working on you know, rice, uh, uh, rice, uh, GM rice. Uh, it's, it's the second largest exporter of rice. Uh, so we know that um, they want to you know, ensure that they're able to produce rice. Uh, you know that uh, with uh, biotechnological, uh, you know that uh, adaptations, uh, so that uh, it is capable of take, uh, taking. Uh, several uh, problems uh, which they face uh, apart from rice they also maize which is another second which important food crop in vietnam also mm, several food crops here uh, citrus mango papaya i know many such crops vietnam is also emphasizing you know, as vietnam is ready uh, technologically uh indonesia also as i told you that uh, it's a rice economy and uh, they are uh, planning says that uh, government must uh, uh, in the, in the, in the long-term development plan of 1994 to 2019, food security was uh, was given major emphasis. Uh, the all government realized that rice economy is a rice economy, and rice uh, people need to be uh, people need to be protected, right, to, uh, against rice shortages, right. And uh, if uh, I don't know whether you're familiar that um, we, have, we have a uh, uh, government, uh, you know that, uh, which uh, faced a lot of crisis because of uh, food famines in the country. But once the government traced on the rice uh, uh, productions, you know, that, uh, and you know, food was available uh, cheaply. The, the famines or riots, political riots, could be tackled much better. 
and Indonesia is the first country in South Asia to use GM crumbs, right? But mm. this corn, corn comes from uh, Montana's uh, American multinationals. Uh, as yet, you know, the public sector has not uh, uh, developed any, uh, but uh, any, uh, any GM crumb, but they are working, they are working in uh, several areas. And in uh, BT cotton, also they have in South Sulawesi province, they are using BT, BT cotton. And okay, so they are also trying GM soybean and corn, etc. Philippines, another country, uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, that uh, developed this uh, biotechnological uh, as a the leading edge. And, uh, and they hope to have uh, sustained economic development through this technology. Uh, they have stressed on transient transgenic banana right uh, papaya mango and only you know several say, coconut which is locally uh, locally high in high demand uh, okay so they are uh, into several steps right and uh, you know what i want, want to say is that the philippines uh, is technologically almost ready right thailand is another is another nice you know that nice producing nation they are also uh, I know that uh, technologically is ready for uh, uh, this, right? So now, GM crops, uh, you see that uh, this uh, uh, percentage of land using in USA is 46%. You know that, uh, you know, GM. Yeah. Uh, Brazil uses 61%, Argentina 64%. They use much more uh, area of land for GM crops. Paraguay, Latin American country, more. Uh, Uruguay, you know, Latin American, many of Latin American countries, they are using uh, their land for GM cultivation and uh, they secure benefit. But India, you know, they're only 7%, China 4%, China 4%, right, Myanmar uh, uh, 3%, and Vietnam as it 0.1%, but this is the actual use of the land, right. So, uh, why well, say that uh, it is a uh, the, uh, technologically ready, but uh, uh, but in implementation wise, commercial use is not much, uh, right? So America, you see that uh, soybean, corn, cotton, you know that. You know, uh, if you see the 2020, over 94 percent in the you know the land is used for GM crops, while Western countries are ready, but uh, Asian countries are not yet ready. Uh, for the fulfillment of revolution. I say that uh, dreams are ready. Technology is ready. Right. But government uh, which government backing, government support which is necessary is somewhere is lacking. Almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. The government is unable to take a very firm stand because of the farmers. Farmers are um, most um, uh, pampered uh, economic groups in, in Asian countries. In India, as yet, we do not have uh, uh, income tax on farming income, right? And because they have, you know, that 70 percent of country's population, they, uh, they are, uh, they, you know, they, they have livelihood related to farming. So, right. And uh, there are several NGOs, you know, that they, they think they, they say that they talk about farmers and. Uh, uh, they say that they are against uh, multinationals, and as a result, what is happening? A revolution, you know, that which is in the making, which is almost ready, which can change the, you know, that uh, whole uh, uh, food production, but government as yet not ready. And you see that uh, in China, I know that uh, government do not allow public opinion, but public opinion is allowed only in case of GMO crops, right? But, you know, it, it happened, you know, several rumors have been spread that uh, GMO crops is, you know, it, it, it creates cancer, it creates so much of health problems, you know, untested hypotheses are, have been spread. And, you know, the Global Times, the Communist Party paper, right, it is also, you know, that uh, suffering from the uh, prejudices, it has uh, made a remark some time back that GMOs are Western conspiracy to people China. This is the this is the this is the point. It gets cancer. Global Times, which is a uh, newspaper of the party CPC, uh, right? It's an international newspaper of the CPC. They comment like this. Okay, so know that uh, 
the government is, you know, government does not give leverage anywhere. Public opinion is not at all counted in China, but in case of GMO, it is right. But in Swayabin, you know that. In case of you know that there is Chinese uh, province called uh, Heilongjiang. Heilongjiang, you know, they produce a Swayabin. You know that, uh, and um, in state, you know, the party's <coughs> newspaper, <coughs> Heilongjiang Daily, they mentioned uh, that. Uh, Soybeans are uncertain. And government, you know, the state took very strong action. Because uh, if the if they be failure young, it does not produce soy and soya soybean will come from um, America. So in order to ensure that hmm, uh, they do not bring American uh, soybean, uh, they ruthlessly you know the stop uh, soya uh, uh, GMO uh, allegations uh, and rumors. Uh, in Helling John province, right? In India, also we have a you know that we went well in a BT Binjal, and you know that uh, eggplant, uh, Binjal, Degun. Uh, government cleared it, but there was a lot of protest, and uh, even in parliament, you know that there was parliament standing committee. Uh, it said that GM crops are just not the right solution for it. I don't know why. No, no, they made the statement. No, the political will is missing, uh, you know, not only in China, also in India. And uh, Jairam uh, Ramesh was the environment minister, you know, that while God, GAC cleared BT Brinjal, but um, uh, Mr. Ramesh, the minister, you know, that uh, introduced, you know, that uh, declared a uh, unilaterally declared a moratorium for 10 years, it cannot be used. Right. But uh, you understand that. Uh, we have uh, enormous amount of um, food demand. Food demand is rising, and uh, yes, uh, yes, there are there are certain problems uh, which need to be tackled um, well through researches, through scientific answers. We need scientific questions. We need scientific answers, right? But you know, the political will is simply not uh, ready. As a result, the revolution that you were expecting uh, could not be realized yet. But the moment we have the political will, you know that uh, we will have a biotechnology revolution. And uh, uh, yes, so as I say that um, uh, in my in the, as a, as a concluding um, uh, statement, I would like to state that genetic engineering uh, replicates a process that has been occurring uh, in nature for millions of years. As bacteria and viruses regularly subtle genes between different species. You know all this. It's not a replication of this virus and bacteria, uh, you know, the different over different uh, species have been occurred. So you know, transgenic uh, production is not new, it's, it's in nature. And uh, many of our pet dogs and cats are, you know, that are uh, technically genetically only modified. As I say, my dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, the biotechnology revolution is ready. It has uh, the potential to settle the food problems, but we must allow uh, the full revolution to be realized. But at the, at the last but not least, I must mention that uh, we cannot say that we have one system enough to feed our 9 billion people. Right? There is no silver bullet which can provide uh, food to everybody. But after the revolution, we need uh, some kind of a solution to our problem. A new avenue is needed and biotechnology uh, provides us the uh, as a new avenue and revolution is ready and we need simply public opinion and we need a political leadership uh, strong enough to implement. Uh, yes, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, such, for such an interesting lecture. Uh, so uh, there is one question that has come up from the audience. Yes, sir. So Shuranjana Halda, she wants to know, is there any statistical survey on GM crops? For populations who are actually using it, and if it is, then what is our advancement over other developed countries? Now you see that um, there are lots of uh, studies on uh, uh, 
uh, GM crops used by human population and uh, as yet, uh, we do not notice much of uh, the health problems. Uh, you see then, I must tell you that uh, animal populations, I mean the livestock populations, the meat that the Westerners eat today, it all GM crops, right? It's all GM crops. The, the soya bean, the corn, uh, it's all GM corn. Canola oil, canola oil that you when you get in all the uh, all, 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 all the supermarket canola oil, right? Uh, so uh, it's a, it's a, it's a GM crop, right? As yet, you know that we do not see much of a uh, uh, health problem uh, to the users. But if there is a problem, you know, then the government need to uh, need to take uh, take to take uh, uh, correctives, interventions. Uh, you know that I don't say that. Uh, no, it has to be utilized uh, without uh, looking into the problems. We have to be cautious, but we have become over cautious. That was my plan. Yes, right. So if our animals are eating and you know that they have a healthy body and we are enjoying the meat, uh, okay. So it indicates clearly that uh, we have no problem as yet, right? So uh, we need a good will, you know, unnecessarily, farmers are unnecessarily uh, suffering from the apprehension that this is bad. But why this is bad, you know, then they have to tell us what is the scientific proof. You cannot, you cannot create a rumor and spread it. That is the main problem with the uh, people against the biotechnology. The farmers are very pampered. We have the uh, farm laws. Not many people read it. I read it. Farm laws, yes. Uh, you know that, but you know that it clears the apprehension that all the farmers' land will be taken away, multinational will come in, and you know it's a halal gulla. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a noise everywhere to clear. But you know, you know that we have to, we have to have a, you know, the strategy for the future. There is not much money, you know, there's not much money there. Government is unable to invest. I have given you the enough data. Farmers do not have the money. Then we have to in, allow the my, uh, industrial people, the corporates, to invest where, wherever they can. This is this is and this is a uh, alternative which we cannot which we which we cannot ignore, right? But farmers, you know that many political parties are allowing this, allowing this uh, this uh, uh, this noise uh, to take place for their political advantages. I say that GMO crop is is another such another such area uh, which is being which is you know that uh, creating unnecessary noises and government needs to be very firm. As I understand, the shipping government in China, uh, they might become very firm at some stage. And the Indian government uh, at the center, probably, you know, that uh, they want to be, you know, that uh, tell that they are, they, they will be very far, right? But, you know, that we have to be, we have to be careful. We have to ensure that it's a full group. Okay, right. Thank you. So, sir, I think this kind of answers the next question is, do you think more awareness about GM crops can help yes. the scenario? Definitely. Awareness is very important. This lecture is my lecture is an awareness lecture. And Chaitali, I will be very happy that uh, uh, if, you, if you take the responsibility of creating the awareness, that, right, we have to do the job of uh, okay, uh, awareness. And we have more people. We have less food. Food dietary habit changing. So how do you survive? How do you, you know where you where from the food will come, right? Okay, so uh, this uh, biotechnology GM crop is the uh, is probably the probably the answer. Okay, yeah. sir. Another question is: Did biotech biotechnology have any significant revolution in Indian context, particularly in agricultural sector till then? Uh, not, yet, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. No. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yes, I said that it's a dream has been created. The revolutionary dream has been created. We have everything ready. Only need the push by the government. Push. Once we have the push by the government, yes, everything is possible, right? We have we have several Indian Indian uh, giant. Uh, you know that biotech agricultural giant will uh, will will evolve. Will get evolved very soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, sir. Uh... Uh, I would like to now invite our mentor and convener, Professor Inari Banerjee, to give her comments. On Namaskar, Professor Bhar Chakravarti. Mane, amade dakha hoy na. Ekhane apna ke webinar pe it was an excuse that uh, we get some time to see each other and talk, uh, especially in this pandemic situation. So I was uh, not able to join in 
just for the first few minutes but after that throughout your talk i have been there so uh, excellent talk and thank you so much for coming on our platform uh, and shinjini you have done a great job moderating although yes. uh, i think this is something that our lab especially being in the translational outcomes area often wonder that uh, whatever happens in the lab do not get translated for obvious reasons and so here we have an economist par excellence who works in an area which is uh, in this uh, you know more and more connected global village uh, where uh, you know problems and solutions have to be um, tackled in a more holistic way so professor dhar chakraborty after the, that excellent lecture uh, and that last uh, you know as a refrain of the last um, discussion what would be your um, advice on the advocacy part because obviously there is a disconnect between the scientists uh, and uh, you know uh, technology developers uh, and the people so and of course also the policy makers perhaps and the scientists do not speak a language which is comprehensive to the people and sometimes there is an enormous sense of entitlement and arrogance also in a very typically you know eurocentric hegemonic way uh, that uh, scientists in india also tend to suffer from uh, so uh, in this situation where problems loom large on the horizon how do you think that uh, you know all these issues need to come on a common table and scientists are not the fit people to do the talking Yes. more and more people from other disciplines also need to come in to to sort this out your comments yes. please yes yes sir <laughs> uh, thank you professor ina banerjee you know that uh, i mean hurry because just have to uh, get into another television uh, studio immediately just one oh, or two oh, lines just course. no 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 yeah. problem one or two lines just i want to add yes okay that please uh, uh, the television company is uh, mane ringing we uh, i just want want to say that uh, you know that there is no hide and seek with regard to the gm crops nothing is hidden you know that uh, let us have a frank debate open discussions open discussion by everybody whoever has a point raise it tell it uh, what is your point uh, but don't spread unnecessary rumors and that is killing the uh, whole thing and uh, i'm sure seminars of this this type were invited a non biologist non scientist to speak and similarly you can ask others to also join and you know that once you uh, know that we are able to create all kinds of uh, unnecessary apprehensions some of the apprehensions are, are really unnecessary and un uncalled for and if we can remove this uh, we can also create a uh, uh, pressure with the government farmers lobby politicians they are, they are able to create and we should be able to create a uh, pressure with the government we as intellectuals unbiased intellectuals we are not in favor of monsanto or any uh, big multinationals we are in favor of more production better production we want to ensure that people live uh, and eat healthy live happily and that is our only purpose and gmo crops has the potential gmo crops have the potential if you have apprehension tell us what are the problems you do not hang it for several years why bt brinjal your all technical bodies permitted it and why government unnecessarily put the veto okay you're right we, we need to uh, create dialogues we consciously need to create dialogues so we will not keep you further we wish you uh, uh, the best for your next program but thank you so much for coming on thank our you. platform and giving that excellent talk thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much thank, thank you. you sir yeah. and thank, thank you ma'am Okay, I will take a leave now. Uh, immediately, I have to join some other group. Okay, thank you very much. No thank problem. You, thank, thank you. Over to you, Shinjini. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you everyone for joining, and join us again tomorrow for a lecture by Professor Raghavendra Gadakar of the Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. And tomorrow's session will be moderated by Dr. Anandita Bhadra of Iser, Kolkata. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our previous talks are all archived there, and you can check them out. And you can also visit our website www.zoologyhub.org. And thank you again for joining us. Take care, and see you again tomorrow.